Good to see you this Lord's Day morning. We have a few prayer requests in our last couple times with uh, in Ephesians. We've been talking about praying for the saints, for one another. Uh, continue to pray for Miss Jerry, the passing of Brother Pete Faulkner. Uh, the viewing, not a viewing, but a uh, graveside will be on Tuesday for some of the family uh, in Trustville. So pray for that graveside service. And then uh, also for Brother David Thorne, uh, his continual battle with cancer. Uh, keep him in your prayers. Brother Jim Dupreece, who's had some health issues also. Uh, David and Trish, who are on route from the Philippines. Uh, they should be in sometime on Monday, I believe. Uh, they were going from Seoul to Detroit, Detroit, Atlanta, Atlanta, back home. And then they will self-quarantine for 14 days. So keep David and Trish in your prayers as they are in a, a long journey right now. And, uh, and also, uh, congratulations to the Farrell family, as Samuel and Dana uh, got married yesterday. As a number of uh, couples now are doing some quiet home ceremonies uh, with the changes in society here. And, uh, but congratulations to the Farrells and to Samuel and Dana. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. We are glad and we rejoice in it. Paul said in Philippians, But with all prepare me a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given to you. And William J. writes in his evening exercise, Paul viewed his restored freedom as a privilege and a favor. I shall be given to you. In another place, he speaks of ministers as the gifts of Christ. And this is true of their commission, their endowments, their success, and all opportunities of exertion. It is he that gives them not only a door of utterance, but a door of entrance. It is easy to see what a hindrance of usefulness the confinement of such a man as Paul was. God is able by his almighty power to overrule evil for good, but we must judge of things by their proper and natural tendency. And thus, persecution involves the heaviest guilt. It is said of Herod after the enumeration of his crimes that he added yet above this, that he shut up John in prison. This was taking the light from the candlestick and putting it under a bushel. It was rendering him a spring shut up, a fountain sealed, 
And hence, says Paul to the Thessalonians, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. What Christian then ought to be indifferent to the progress of civil liberty, which, justly considered, always includes religious and affords opportunity for exertion and cooperation in extending the cause of knowledge, truth, righteousness, and peace. But see also the importance and efficacy of prayer. The prayer of Abraham prevailed for the healing of Abimelech. Joshua by prayer lengthened the days for Israel to complete their victory. By prayer, 15 years were added to the life of Hezekiah. The church of Jerusalem prayed for Peter's enlargement and he was delivered by an angel before the prayer meeting broke up. And what says Paul to the Philippians? I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Here also he says, I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given to you. Sometimes prayer succeeds in obtaining the very blessing itself, which it implored. At other times, the answer brings a substitute for it, as when Paul besought the Lord to remove a thorn in the flesh and receive the assurance of all sufficient grace under it. But the prayer of the righteous shall be granted, and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, not only when it is offered for himself, but also for others. Here also is a proof that the usefulness of prayer is not confined to the influence of the performance, but includes also success and acquisition. The prayers we offer for ourselves really affect us by the very exercise of the duty. But if our prayers for others benefit them, when at the very time they may be ignorant of our offering them, this must be by God's doing something in a way of answer. This is the very ground and encouragement of our offering them. And the Bible is filled with instances of the accomplishment of such prayers as it is with commands for the performance of them. So we've been looking at uh, Paul's admonition for the saints to pray for each other, the saints to pray for ministers, and then today we'll look at the minister's life and his prayers as well for the saints. Let's continue our worship now with the singing of hymns. We'll begin today with hymn number 13 in the Trinity. Those here stand with me, please. Number 13.
Father, we thank you for the day that you have granted us in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the worship of the one true and living God. We are reminded by the hymn writer that there is worship in heaven continually by mighty beings who continually say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and shall be. And we are thankful, Lord, that you have granted us life in our Lord Jesus Christ, that we could enter into this worship as well. Though feeble our worship be, we are thankful that it is received through the blood of the everlasting covenant, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from every sin and draws us near unto God, and that you have called us to come near to you. And so we ask that you would forgive our sins even this morning that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that you would lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, be with Sister Jerry and uh, with Pete's passing. Pray that you would uphold and strengthen the family and bless in the graveside service that they will have together. We pray, Father, that you would be with Brother David Thorne and Brother Jim and continue to uphold and strengthen them, Lord, in their time of need. Enable them to, to look to Thee and strengthen their faith in Thee. We pray that You would be with David and Trish and keep them safe in their journeys and thankful that they are able to come home for a season now uh, to be with us and that You would protect and guide them in all things. For each and every one in the congregation, many needs before us, Lord, and uh, we're thankful for the provision that you have made for each one, and especially for that spiritual provision in our Lord. We pray that you would uphold and strengthen each one in the Lord this day, that you would teach us by your word, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us in the most holy faith, continue to strengthen the principles upon which we build our lives in the word of God. And we ask, Lord, now that you would hear us through the mediation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading in the Old Testament will be in Psalm 122 and then 133. Psalm 122 and then 133. 122 concerning peace, 133 concerning unity. Psalm 122, a song of degrees of David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together, whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, peace be within thee because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. And then Psalm 133, another song of degrees of David. <clears throat> Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon and in the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. We're going to switch over to the Broadman hymnal now and do number 184, Take My Life and Let It Be. 184. Take my life and let it be consecrated. Take my voice. 
Ephesians chapter 6 for our scripture reading in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning with verse 10. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that you also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent to you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And number 94, if those of you here would stand with me, please. 94 in the Trinity.
turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6. We come to uh, the conclusion of the book in which we are going to see uh, the minister's life, the minister's prayers, the minister's blessing. He says in verse 21, but that you may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for your word. We ask again that you would aid us and help us as we enter into the text of Scripture. We know that you are the author. The Spirit of God gives us light and understanding in the text for your glory and for our good, and we pray that you might uh, strengthen us this day in your truth, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. That you may know our affairs, Paul says. We see the minister's life in verses 21 and 22, his prayers in verse 23, and then a blessing in verse 24. The minister is called to lead the church. We've been going through the section that deals with the armor of God. And after uh, we went through the armor, he then talked about the attitude of the soldier, praying for one another as soldiers, and then also praying for the leadership in the church as Paul asked for prayers for himself in verse 19, that utterance would be given to him and that he would be bold in his uh, proclamation of the truth. The minister leads by preaching and teaching, by personal exhortation, uh, by calling men near to himself, the parakaleo that is in this text. He leads by example in the Christian life, and he leads by the concern he shows. And as we look at the scriptures and the Pauline epistles, we see Paul's concern for the congregations, which he established as a church planter, and also their concern in turn for him as well. And so I think when Paul says in verse 21 that you may know my affairs, what it's telling us is that there was a mutual love between Paul and the congregations. Paul had generally given the congregations over to other elders to assume rule, though Paul always was the beloved founder of these congregations. Paul shows concern for the congregations, and in turn, they are concerned for him. He was concerned for their affairs. They are concerned for his affairs. The affairs he was concerned for were not personal details in which he would have no business. He was concerned for their spiritual uh, affairs, their Christian walk, their testimony. He was concerned about, and they were concerned for him and his labors in the gospel and his personal welfare. So they were concerned for one another's testimony uh, because that had to do with the glory of God in the church. And so Paul says that he's going to send to them Tychicus. And uh, who is this man? If we turn to Acts chapter 20, uh, Dr. Luke tells us there when he lists out a, a number of men, actually, Acts chapter 20, uh, talking about some of Paul's companions. He says, There accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Ga Gaius of Derbe, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. So we know that this uh, Tychicus was one of, one of many companions of Paul. Paul had a retinue of people around him that he was mentoring and that were that he considered his fellow laborers as he worked in the world, uh, the gospel. And this Tychicus also was called by Paul in Colossians chapter 4, which is the sister book to Ephesians, 
Colossians chapter 4 and verse 7. Paul says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent to you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, and they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So we have a similar ending in the book of Colossians when Paul says that Tychicus is not only sent to the Ephesians to make them aware of what's going on with Paul, but he does that. For, uh, Tychicus also is going to carry the letter to the Colossians and carry the letter to the Ephesians as well and to, to let them know the details that are not given in the book. Uh, the book is given to the Colossians and the Ephesians by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There is instruction throughout the book. Uh, but then as far as the personal details of Paul, how he was doing, what was happening in the ministry, other details, uh, Tychicus would be able to share with them. And he calls him a beloved brother in Colossians 4, 7, and a faithful minister. So he's first of all a Christian brother in the Lord. He is second of all, called to be a minister, even as Paul. So he is a fellow servant in the Lord. And he said he sent him to the Colossians to know their estate as well. So I'm sure it is the same with the Ephesians, <coughs> that Paul not only desires to let the Ephesians know how he is doing, but he wants to know exactly how they are doing uh, in the details of the individuals of the congregations uh, as he shares at the end of the book of Romans. He shares a lot of names with us, salutes a lot of different people. And so he would have been regularly in prayer for a number of people in these congregations. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 12, Titus was on the island of Crete, setting in order the things that were wanting, uh, once again establishing the churches there. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul says, when I shall send Artemis unto you or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. So he was sending one of those two, and it may we don't know which. <coughs> it may have been Tychicus that was sent. So Paul considered him a faithful minister and that he was going to help out on the island of Crete in establishing the churches there. We do know that he was sent to Ephesus in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 9. 2 Timothy 4, in verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. <clears throat> For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And we enjoy reading that, seeing that that, <coughs> that difficulty was uh, healed, that happened. We read about it in the book of Acts. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. And so we have at the end of the book of Ephesus, that you may know my affairs, how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you our affairs. He's going to fill in the blanks, let them know how Paul is doing, and give a report to the churches who are interested in Paul's ministry and welfare. So the minister's life, the minister's life is a life that's known to the congregation, and even when the, when the congregation is afar off. The congregation is to be concerned about the life of its ministers because the ministers are to be setting the example, and the ministers have requirements that they are to meet, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, that the bishop or the pastor, the elder, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, not, but gentle, and not quarrelsome or covetous, one who rules his own house, well, 
having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And so Paul to the Hebrews says, remember then those that have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow and consider the end of their conversation, their lifestyle. So the congregation is to be concerned about the affairs of the minister um, because he is to be the example. He is to set the example for the congregation to uh, follow him in his behavior. And it should be godly behavior. But that you may know my affairs and how I do. So the Apostle Paul speaks of this relationship that he had with the Ephesian church. Paul knows the church has an interest in his labors. That's why he says what he says. There is a a good relationship with them. And and we have to say that this this is here even amidst the reproofs that he has had to send, the disciplines that he has had to enact. Uh, Not that everyone, we know that some people left Paul, that some forsook him, uh, that some would not hear a rebuke, that some never returned from doctrinal impurity, Uh, But yet, amidst all of those troubles and all of those problems within the churches, uh, still Paul shows forth uh, the love and care and concern that he has for all those who are in the churches, and that there is in general among the church itself also a concern for Paul. So he sends the letter by Tychicus, and uh, we we get newsletters from ministers on the field that uh, we support or that we know or that we pray for. And uh, these, are, these are important communications that we should read because if we're going to pray intelligently for folks, if we're gonna show forth a concern for those who are on the field, then we should read what they tell us about their ministry, the needs that are there, the prayer concerns that they have. Now, in a day and age in which in the church, uh, there, there began to be a business model uh, of the church. I know of, I know of some folks. There was a, a friend of mine whose parents were missionaries, and he used to tell me that the day of the month, they would have a day in which they would, they would write their newsletter. He said that was the, the worst time of the month every month. He said because of the pressure that was put on them, to try to show forth some sort of uh, progress according to the American mind, uh, numbers, you know, if he didn't have the right numbers and that sort of thing. But he said, he said he remembers as a child that that was the worst time every month for the family whenever they had to send that newsletter out. And uh, and it became uh, known as a practice that some would inflate numbers or or speak uh, glowingly of things just because they felt they had to in order to garner continued support. But a minister's report is not a profit and loss summary for a corporation. It is the report of a minister's labors, his fears, his triumphs, his failures. It is a record of striving to be a faithful witness of Christ. And when we see Paul writing to the churches, He writes, uh, oftentimes he's writing from jail or had just got out of jail. He writes of those who deserted him and have left the ministry. He writes uh, of everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He simply gives a report of what God is doing as he is faithfully striving to bring the gospel to whatever particular city that he is in. And in some of the cities, like the Bereans, he says they were more noble than others, that they checked it out in the scriptures to see if things were so while other cities were infamous in the way that they treated Paul and ran him out of the city. Um, So uh, there is no need for us to have uh, these empty, vain expectations of those who are on the field that have to meet some kind of preconceived notions of our own or expectations of numbers. Our desire is that they would be faithful to the word of God and the ministry that Christ has given to them. This care that was a mutual care between Paul and the churches. Paul loved 
uh, the people and the people loved him. Turn to Philippians chapter one. Let's look at a, a couple of instances of this with other churches as well, <coughs> in which there is at times a little further explanation. Philippians chapter one. And these are the kind of relationships that uh, ministers should have with their churches and the churches should have with their ministers. Not the business model, not the running men out of the pulpit and out of the church because they haven't brought enough numbers in, which has been, you wanna talk about a pandemic in this country, that's a pandemic. That's what has happened, that has became normalized in this country so that the average stay of a minister uh, oftentimes was two years in a church, which is not enough time even to get to know your congregation. And very different from what we see in some of the Puritan era where you would have men at a church for 40 years, for 50 years, their whole lifetime, they would spend there with the people. Philippians 1.3, Paul was thankful for those believers. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Not a warfare between minister and people, but rather Paul speaks of the gratitude that he has for those people. And even in the midst of perhaps troubles that he would face with the congregation as well. Thank God for God's work upon them. Verse four, he was praying for them always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy. And the prayers were not uh, with a, a sad heart, but rather with joy in the Lord, believing prayers for that minister, believing that God was at work and would work in them. Verse five, he speaks of the fellowship that he had with the saints, for your fellowship in the gospel. And that's where the fellowship has to be if there's going to be unity in the church. The fellowship has to be in the gospel. If the fellowship is around bowling or around golf or around something else, uh, and that's all only kind of fellowship that they have, then oftentimes that kind of fellowship can go to pieces pretty quickly. But if it's a fellowship in the gospel, then there will be this care for one another's affairs. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now, being confident of this very thing that he that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that the church that gathers together, minister and congregation, the one thing they have in common is, is the work of God, the work that God has begun in their hearts and will be continued until the day of Jesus Christ. So the church is unique and it is different as far as a called out group. The word ecclesia is used in the New Testament. It could be used of a political gathering. Uh, it could be used of a gathering of any people together. But the ecclesia, as far as the New Testament goes, the word as it has been taken over by the New Testament was a gathering of spiritual people, of people who had a love for the Lord Jesus Christ and a uh, unity. Philippians 1.27, we see here Paul wanted to know how they were getting on. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. He was telling them of his affairs, he wanted to know about their affairs as well. That you stand fast in one spirit, there's the unity, one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is the interest that he has with them. And then Philippians 1.12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. He knew that they were interested in what happened to him. And they often heard that it seemed like some bad things were happening to him, such as being taken prisoner in Rome. But he wanted them to know that God was still on the throne and that he didn't want them to be discouraged, just like in the book of Ephesians, he sent Tychicus to comfort their hearts and to let them know <coughs> that God is indeed on the throne and that the gospel does go forward even though he was imprisoned. And the Philippians were those who kept up with Paul. Philippians chapter four and verse 15. Now ye Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. 
For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again to my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit to abound to your account. And I have all in abound, and I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. The Philippians were a congregation of the Lord who kept up with Paul. They sent to find out about his needs, and when there were needs there, they sacrificed themselves to get Paul help in those needs. It was greatly appreciated by Paul. And in fact, they didn't know it, but they were the only church doing it at the time. So who knows those things? Only God knows those things. But we see here the love that Paul had to the Philippians and the Philippians had for Paul, just like the Ephesians. And then one other place, I want us to go to the book of Thessalonians. The book of Thessalonians, which, which gives us, as far as a pastoral theology, it gives us a lot more information than other books. Paul cared about the Thessalonians as well, and I think this is this gives us insight into Paul's attitude and the way that he ministered to all the churches. It's just spoken of more here. Paul's relationship to the church was not a professional relationship. That is, not one that was distant or aloof. His relationship was more of a familial relationship as he considered the congregation his sons and daughters in Christ. It was, effect, it was an affectionate, soulish relationship that he had. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear to us. Not the gospel of God only, but our own souls. Not just the, the propositions of the gospel, not just propositional truth, but his heart was in it to share with them his own experience in the Lord, his own desires and longings after their growth in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And this is something that every minister of the gospel, every leader in the church has to cultivate in their own hearts because within all churches, there are, there are rubs, there are troubles that come up, there are personality differences um, because we live in a sinful world. So in the midst of that, uh, bringing together a, a group of people who are all sinners by the, saved by the grace of God, there will always be those irritations that come up which are a part of our sanctification. But for the ministers of Christ, for those who are in leadership, they have to especially seek to cultivate this attitude of affection uh, and that the people be dear to them. Uh, and despite any trouble that they might be caused, uh, they are to realize that these are God's sheep. They, are, they belong to God and that as under shepherds, they are to tenderly care for them. 1 Thessalonians 2.9, Paul's labor among them. You remember, brothers, our labor and our travail, laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached to you the gospel of God. And he lived in a right way among them. Verse 10, you are witnesses and God also how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. This is why the ministry is a high calling. Paul calls them to witness and God to witness that he lived in a holy manner, a just manner, unblameable manner among those. So it's a very high standard that the minister is to maintain. And Paul loved them as a father. Verse 11, <clears throat> as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. And this is important as far as Pauline understanding of the pastoral ministry. Uh, the minister, just like the ministry is not a business model and the church does not have a CEO, there's no CEOs in a church. The church is a family and Paul understood it to be that he was as a father and they were as children to him that he cared for them, had affection for them, 
in that way, charge them as a father does his children. So the, the pastor, the bishop, the, the elders, they're not the bosses. They're not a boss. Your boss is at work, and your boss will relate to you differently at work <clears throat> than a pastor will in the church. So the pastor, the elders have authority. That authority is only based upon the word of God. And, but at the same time, pastors seek to maintain this soulish relationship with the congregation uh, as a father to one's children, this love that they are to have for them. Though Paul had to exhort and charge and discipline in the church, it did not change his affection, uh, just like it doesn't change a father's affection for their children. A father goes through many issues with his children. And if he has many children, he goes through many different issues with his many children. <coughs> and some seem to be a greater issue than others. It just is the way it is, and it is for everybody. But it never, for a Christian father, it does not change the strength of that father's love for that child. He loves that child. He may have to discipline that child. He may have to have some tough love with that child, but it doesn't change the fact that he loves that child. And that's the way the minister is to be with the congregation as well. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. He says, but we brothers being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. So the minister has to, as Paul shows in, in the affection that he has for them and they have for him, the minister has to strive at all times to keep the people in his heart, uh, to never let it get to the point to where he doesn't want to see them. <laughs> wants to avoid them. And pastors can get that way. And elders can get that way. And deacons can get that way. And any of the leadership in the church can get that way <coughs> to where they have an individual that they just don't want to see. They would rather not see. And there's some that are more difficult than others. That's understandable. But at the same time, Paul says that they were absent as far as bodily from him, but not from his heart. And so because and I think it's probably because of the faithful prayer life of Paul. This is what kept up that relationship in the heart, <clears throat> that God kept the fire of, of divine love toward the saints going in the heart of Paul, despite all of the troubles that he faced within the congregations, uh, because God was upholding him in that. But we brothers being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. It's fine to make phone calls and it's nice to make letters and to do emails and to twit on Twitter and whatever else people do these days. But Paul says, and it's the same today, to see you in face, face to face is different. And this is something that we're facing right now in our country with uh, the congregations not being able to come together face to face in mass and looking forward to a return to that because there's just something about that physical presence of seeing somebody face to face that's different no matter how much communication you give to them and even if you give them FaceTime. Even if you can see their face virtually, you're not in their presence still. There's a difference. Verse 18, wherefore we would have come to you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? You are our glory and our joy. The apostles hope that his ministry was truly fruitful. The apostles joy in seeing the work of grace in these lost souls. The apostles crown of rejoicing is that fruitful labor is his reward and exaltation. So his love for them was an earnest, genuine love. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. 
Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and send Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in the gospel to establish you and comfort you concerning your faith. He said we couldn't stand it anymore. Why couldn't he stand it? Well, it had to do with the spiritual relationship that he had with them and the spiritual concerns that he had for them. His concern was their faith, to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know we are appointed thereto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as, even as it comes to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. So this is the family relationship within the church. It's a concern for our spiritual lives. It's a concern that somebody doesn't fall away. It's a concern that the tempter hasn't tempted them through some hardship that they're experiencing to move away from the faith. It is from Hebrews to exhort one another daily while it is today. And he says, verse 9, or verse 8 says, For now uh, we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And that's the kind of heart connection that Paul had with the congregation. And I believe the congregation had with Paul as well. Because part of what they had to be comforted was not just their own persecutions or their own hardships, but their hearts were tied up in their leaders. Their heart was tied up in Paul. And as they heard of things happening to Paul, he didn't want them to become discouraged that he had somehow would leave the faith or be discouraged as well. And the same thing with uh, Philippians as well. In Philippians uh, chapter 2, we read about uh, Timotheus and Epaphroditus. And Paul says in verse 23, Him therefore I hope to send presently so soon as I, as I will see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord I also myself will come. Yet I suppose that necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor. He's a great help to me, but I wanted to send him back. Your messenger, he had been sent from the church there, and he that ministered to my wants, he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because you had heard that he had been sick. <laughs> he was burdened because they were burdened. He was concerned because he was worried that they were concerned about him being sick. And this is the mutual love and concern that we have for one another. It is, it is, a, it is almost a contest of concern that we have for each other because being tied together in a oneness that we have in Christ, a husband and wife are one. And when a wife hurts or a husband hurts, the other hurts too. And there's, there's, there's an immediate tie and rejoicing with rejoicing, mourning with mourning. And in a larger sense, the scripture teaches us that the, the whole congregation is that way, that there is a oneness among the congregation as well. And so Paul says in verse 27, for indeed he was sick near to death, but God had mercy on him and not just on him, Epaphroditus, but on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul says if he had died, it not only would have been difficult for him and for you, but for me because I'm concerned about your concern for him. He's your leader. I want him to be well and I want him to be back with you. So I just want you to see this triangle of love, this triangle of concern, uh, so that when Paul to the Ephesians says, I want you to know about my affairs, it's because they really wanted to know about the affairs of Paul, uh, because this is the way that they operated. But that you may know my affairs, he says in Ephesians 6.21, and how I do, Take a kiss, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things <clears throat> whom I have sent to you for that same purpose that you can know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. And this is the parakaleo, may comfort your hearts. The parakaleo means in the Greek to call near, to call near that he would call your hearts near 
to hear the message, to hear the message and to hear these things. What is this parakaleo? What is this comfort that he's talking about? That he might comfort your heart. This parakaleo of the heart is, is humility and not pride. 1 Corinthians 4.13, Paul says, being defamed, we're blasphemed. We entreat, parakaleo, we call men near to us. They, in their pride, blaspheme us. We, in humility, call them near unto ourselves to share with them truth, that he might comfort your hearts. It is an entreating, an entreating. It's oftentimes uh, translated as entreating. First Timothy 5.1, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him. Call him near to yourself. So you don't rebuke an elder, you call him near to yourself like a father, like you would treat a father, the respect and regard. And 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, <coughs> reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That's our word again. Call men near to yourself with all long suffering and doctrine. There is rebuke, but then there's also this entreating. It is calling men near. <coughs> And this is what Paul wanted Tychicus to do when he went to the Ephesians. He wanted their hearts to be comforted by this relationship that he had in calling them near unto himself, sharing the things <coughs> that Paul had for them. In fact, sharing Paul's heart with them. Calling men near. The same word is used in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, I call you near brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Romans 15, 30, now I beseech you, I call you near brethren for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the spirit that you strive <coughs> together with me in your prayers to God for me. <coughs> Tychicus would have done that. He would have said, brothers, Paul needs your prayers. He asks for your prayers. He, he covets your prayers. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Tychicus would have done that as well, saying, uh, Brothers, you know, we need to be unified around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here are the essentials that we must be unified around. There are other things which minutia that are not necessary necessary to be so unified with, but here is what must be. William Burkett in his notes writes this. He says, the second end St. Paul had in sending Tychicus from himself to the Ephesians was that he might comfort their hearts. How could Tychicus do this? Three ways. Number one, by making known to them the true cause of his sufferings. St. Paul's enemies had laid heavy things to his charge. These might perhaps fly as far as Ephesus. It flies very fast these days, uh, but it, it would fly even in those days as well. Now, though the apostle regarded little what the wicked world said about him, yet he desired to be set right in the thoughts of the churches and accordingly sends Tychicus to acquaint them with the cause of his imprisonment. So. He cares little what the world thinks of him, but he wants the church to understand that why he's in prison is not for evil, but for good that he did. Secondly, Burkett writes, to keep them from discouragement and being inordinately cast down at the report of his sufferings. No doubt St. Paul's chain entered into their souls and his sufferings were their sorrow. He therefore sends Tychicus to prevent their immoderate sorrow and mourning upon this account, to let them know he's okay, that he's all right, to keep them from discouragement at the report of his sufferings, that he goes on in the Lord, that he is happy in the Lord, that he joys in the Lord, that he is prospering in the Lord. Uh, we may suffer much and we may, may be in much pain, whether it's physical, emotional, civil, or however that suffering may come to us, and yet we can be well in the Lord. And Tychicus needed to make that known to the people because, again, their hearts were knit together. 
Thirdly, to comfort their hearts with the report of that holy joy and cheerfulness of spirit which was found with him under all sufferings. Oh, it is an excellent sight to behold the saints at liberty, mourning over their afflicted brothers, and they that are sufferers becoming comforters of those that are at liberty. So it mattered not whether they are in a state of confinement or liberty, they had a concern for each other. Because whether you are confined or at liberty, there is a devil who can tempt and who can bring you into a, a bad state. And so Paul was concerned for them that were at liberty. They were concerned for Paul who was in chains. Burkett writes, Lord, never does thy holy religion appear more glorious than when thy ministers commend it by their sufferings for it. And no way can they commend it higher than by a holy, humble cheerfulness of spirit in their sufferings for it. Thy ministers preach with far greater advantage from a prison than they can from a pulpit. Because that, that message is, uh, is strengthened by the experience that they're going through and therefore the example they are showing. So this is the minister's life in verse 21 and 22. But that you may know my affairs, he says, because he's convinced they want to know his affairs because of the affection that they have for each other. And how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make it known to you. As we look at Paul and his journeys, he has a retinue of people around him. He is constantly mentoring them. They are constantly working with him, ministering to his wants, sometimes in prison, but he is ever and always sending them out. He is always jettisoning them out. Uh, he will not keep them even though he enjoys their fellowship and that they're helping him in his time of want. He sends them to this church. He sends them to that church. He sends them with this message and that message. Whom I have sent to you for the same purpose that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. It's a good thing that their hearts needed comforting over Paul. It meant that they loved Paul. It meant that they kept up with Paul, that they were concerned for Paul and were concerned knowing that Paul was just a man again. Um, we, Paul was one of those larger than life figures and yet he was but a man and he did covet their prayers and ask for their prayers and felt desertion when he was deserted. He spoke of it. Uh, and therefore, these churches that communicated with him were a great comfort to his soul. Uh, and he therefore wanted to make sure that they were comforted as well uh, concerning himself. So that's the minister's life. Next time we will look at the minister's prayers that he has for the saints and his final blessing upon the Ephesians. Father, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for the relationship that we see the Apostle Paul had with the churches that he established, uh, even amidst all of the troubles and difficulties that there are in establishing such churches. Uh, we are grateful to see the grace of God that was given to Paul and to these congregations to have a mutual love one for another because we know in your word it says how wonderful it is when brethren dwell together in unity. And so we pray that you would grant us as well, grant each and every minister, every leader within the congregation to cultivate this kind of heart for the saints that are in the congregation and that the saints themselves would cultivate a love for their leaders and ministers as well. And we ask, O oh Father, that you would, would be with those who are abroad as well. And we think of Brother Ron in Virginia, and we think of uh, Jack, Jackie Sprinkle and the loss of her husband. We think of uh, Brother Barry in the Philippines who now uh, has lost his fellowship with uh, Brother David who is flying home at this point. Uh, we think of Brother Woodrow in Mozambique. We think of Brother Miles in Spain, Brother Renato in Italy. Uh, Father, many, many of our brothers uh, in all parts of the world we ask for your comforts to be upon them, to uphold them and strengthen them in the work of the gospel. Some, like Brother Snyder and others who are home because of a disease that they have contracted on the field. We pray in each situation, Lord, that you would strengthen their hearts and that they would know 
our love for them. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. You are dismissed.